all know Kerry O'Brien has been and still will be a key feature of the media landscape in Australia. Um, he has been uh, a journalist for nearly 50 years, the large proportion of that with the ABC. He spent six years anchoring Late Line. He helmed the 7.30 report for 15 years and, of course, as I said, has just come off the back of five years being the front man for Four Corners. In fact, uh, for the younger ones here in the days before reality TV, uh, it's probably dating me, but uh, my version of reality TV in the 1990s and last decade was switching on to 7.30 every night and watching Kerry O'Brien eviscerate whichever Prime Minister or Opposition Leader or Senior Cabinet Minister was foolish enough to uh, sit in the studio with him. Uh, always had the ability to forensically pick apart, pick apart any political argument and ask all the right questions. Uh, Kerry's here as well to promote his book uh, on uh, Paul Keating. It comes off the back of that very successful four-part series of TV interviews that Kerry conducted with uh, Paul in 2013. Uh, as he jokes, uh, his conversation with the former Prime Minister has been the longest single conversation he's had with anybody in his entire life. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing about uh, his close encounters with uh, the former Prime Minister and also, uh, I suspect without too much encouragement, his views on the current political scene. Uh, Kerry will talk for about 20 minutes and is more than happy to take your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kerry O'Brien. Uh, always after a tall person, it's important to adjust the microphones. Michael, I, um, I wish it were true that every time I interviewed a Prime Minister or an opposition leader or any other politician that I left them eviscerated at the end. Um, sadly, uh, most times I left just feeling frustrated and it was no, um, it was no accident that I had a cartoon uh, pinned to my office door for the last few years at 7.30 that was about Groundhog Day uh, and that was because most of the politicians, I mean really it was like, it was like the same interview 422 times with a few exceptions. Anyway. Um, I, uh, I had this dilemma about whether to um, treat my colleagues uh, the same as I've treated the audiences around the rest of the country and go for a few laughs and tell a few inside stories. Um, and then I thought, oh, no, 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 you're a serious bunch. You, you, you guys take life seriously. And this is Melbourne. And Melbourne is the thinking capital of Australia. So I figure for 20 minutes I'm going to have a somewhat more serious streak running through it, but I'm very happy to go for a few laughs if you ask the right questions. And I guess I've got two things to talk about today. One involves a debut and the other a finale. Keating is my first book and Four Corners on Monday night was my last appearance on the ABC as a national television current affairs presenter. I want to talk mostly about the book and the history it covers, but I'm certainly happy to take questions about the 50 year span and in particular the massive changes to our craft covering my time as a journalist. When I started work at the Channel 9 newsroom on Mount Cuther overlooking Brisbane, Bob Menzies was Prime Minister. Some of you want me to tell you who Bob Menzies was? Arthur Caldwell was Labor leader, black and white television, was six years old in Queensland and I was paid in pounds, shillings and pence. Every mainland capital had an afternoon newspaper and if big news like the Kennedy assassination happened overseas, Australians waited up to three days, possibly four, to see the film footage on television. Decade by decade, I've watched the face of journalism change profoundly in particular ways, some of them very important. The Keating book covers the same era almost exactly, which is not surprising given that we were born less than two years apart. And I'd like to point out that he was first. When Paul Keating entered parliament in 69, Labor was still recovering from a deep and bitter split and had been in opposition for 20 long years. As a nation, Australia still thought of itself as white Anglo-Saxon, was still inward looking, and we were in the Vietnam War because of our twin fears, the red peril and the yellow peril. When Paul Keating left the Prime Ministership 27 years later, Australia had undergone an economic, social, and indeed political revolution. We occupied a dramatically different place in our region, and Keating's influence was at the heart of the process. In explaining why I was compelled to produce the Keating interview series for the ABC and then the book, 
I should start by acknowledging that he was far from alone in his single-minded pursuit of political leadership. Bob Menzies started his own party and then very effectively saw off practically every potential challenger who emerged. Malcolm Fraser and Bob Hawke had prime ministerial intent from a very early age. But as a politician, Keating was a fascinating and I think on this landscape, a uh, unique combination of things. He was a journalist dream, in part he was hard-nosed and ruthlessly uh, political as a warrior, as a political warrior, and in part self-taught aesthetic philosopher, fired by restless curiosity and ambition, and those two things I think are so important in understanding what drove Keating and, and I think goes to the heart of his success, curiosity and imagination. The way he was drawn to the flame of power and with ambition in spades. But the ambition wasn't just to get to the top and then scratch his head and wonder what he'd do. It was also to change Australia. He had dimension, a surprising candour at times, a compelling way with words and always a story to weave. And let's not forget the sense of mischief. He had his admirers and a long list of enemies that he acknowledged with pride. The sword of his personality was double-edged. Attributes in the eyes of some were flaws in the eyes of others. The cocky way he came to dominate the parliament. As he would say, throwing liberals around like rag dolls. Amused his followers, but many uh, Australians were left watching and reading from home uneasy. And on the political background, he didn't like to take a backward step or admit a mistake that he felt might be taken as a sign of weakness. And after the recession we had to have, for which his eventual acceptance of ultimate responsibility came very reluctantly, and then only with a caveat, I'll take responsibility for the recession if you'll give me the credit for the 20 years plus of growth and low inflation. Uh, so you'll find because of, because of that, that incapacity to really stick his head up and say, sorry, wasn't just me, but we got it wrong. People, you will find people in Australia a quarter of a century later who still profess to hate his guts. So quite apart from the, all the arguments of policy and politics that Keating has provoked down the years, these are the things that I sought to achieve first with the interview series for the ABC and now with the book. To take one of the most significant and successful activist politicians in Australian history and bring the microscope to bear on the combination of things that made him what he was. Where did the fierce and single-minded ambition and fascination for power come from? When he achieved that power, what did he do with it? And how did he harness the various institutions of government in the process? So the policy is there and there's some debate and some scrutiny on policy and outcomes, but my Fundamental fascination really is to do with the nature of power and how people use it. And since this guy was such a successful exponent of it and came to it so young and had such a single-minded um, view of getting to it, those were the things that drove my interest. I can't think of a politician uh, who has made and articulated a more intense study of the processes and institutions of power than Keating. The book isn't an exercise in lauding the virtues of the man and ignoring the flaws. I believe they come through quite clearly and are there to be judged. For instance, in the last years of his prime ministership, I think a fascinating pattern emerges of a leader who, having won the unwinnable election in 93, becomes more and more bored by the politics of the game and declares a kind of war on the press gallery as he becomes more and more immersed in policy. And, uh, some of you were probably there. Uh, and if, if you were, you'll remember that Keating was seen as this guy, and he took a pride in bringing the journalists along on the journey, what he saw as the journey, the journey of reform, the journey of changing Australia. And he wasn't insulting us by saying, I've got you in my pocket. He wasn't saying we were his lapdogs. What he was saying was, I wove the stories and you reported them you took the debate seriously, and we all did. I think that was, that, that period, the kind of, the education of those of us who didn't spend a lot of time studying economics, 
This was going back 70s, 80s and into the 90s. There weren't a lot of journalists in the gallery that were all that literate on economics and there certainly weren't a lot of politicians going back to the, to the earlier end of that equation. So there was an education process going on in the country and Keating was leading it. And I think even his enemies would acknowledge that. And the gallery was fundamental in that process. And I, you know, Barry would remember, you'd sit, uh, you'd sit through some of his press conferences for an hour and uh, he'd be there until the last question was asked. There'd be none of this rushing off, you know, none of this bullshit about the, the very carefully orchestrated uh, seven minute doorstop or the 14 minute um, press conference where uh, on an important issue you, you get the report to look at as the minister walks into the room and you've got no chance of properly preparing your questions and then just as it's starting to get sticky, the minister suddenly has another engagement. Keating took us seriously saw us as important in the process, and yeah, he wooed us. He, he trusted the power of his capacity to explain and bring us along on the journey. But then, in his view, by the time he became Prime Minister, the journos were no longer interested in the journey because he'd said, well, we've done, pretty much done the economic reforms now. Uh, bigger, big reforms to do with a bigger picture now. And his, his view, view is, people lost interest because there was this new guy called Hewson with his big new plan called uh, Fight Back. So pretty much most of the journos had decided that Hewson was going to win the next, elect next election. He was the new game in town. Um, Keating proved all of us wrong. Uh, and then when we all came back to business as usual, and business wasn't as usual because he thought we were slackers. He took us less seriously uh, and, uh, and that got worse because the journos then you know, when Downer came along, there was another flurry of interest in Downer, and then when Downer went, there was another flurry of interest in Howard. And uh, Don Watson wrote in his book that, uh, in, in his frustration, he said at one point to the office, what are we, to get the media's attention, what have we got to do, send up smoke signals? They do a big announcement. This is the Keating view. They do the big announcement of something that had been worked on over months for a new policy area, and it'd be gone in two days. So... Keating's frustration combined with his boredom, as he acknowledges, with the politics, and the fact that he became more and more engrossed in policy, I think partly because he also felt that his chances of winning the next election, even if he absolutely tried to the maximum, were not that high, because apart from, apart from the, the Howard view of people waiting with their baseball bats to get him in 96, having missed him in 93 over the recession, um, there was, the, there was the issue of incumbency. People were, were being asked in 96 to vote Labor in for 16 straight years. So that was a huge ask too. And I think that was a factor in the equation. But when you look uh, in, in part four of the big book which deals with the prime ministership, I think you see this pattern emerging uh, and particularly by the time Howard comes along where, where um, he's congratulating himself on making his big policy wins, but meanwhile the ship, ship is sinking. So um, you can pin Keating's landslide defeat in 96 on a number of factors, not least of which was the electoral's weariness with 13 years of a reforming government, some hangover of bitterness from the recession. But Keating, if Keating had remained totally switched onto the politics, I think he would have still been in there with a chance. It's a big statement in a way for those of you who remember the times but being the kind of formidable, deeply unpredictable person that he was, if he, had been taking the, if he hadn't taken his eye off the politics, he would, I think, have been in with a chance in 96. And uh, extraordinary when you think of it. We've seen it happen occasionally in the state scene, but he saw off Houston and Downer in one year. And he had one year left to do Howard over, and it was just too much. He may never have done it. He might have, you know... He, he would say, give me another year and I'd have done it. Of course he'd say that. And he might be right and he might be completely wrong. But, but to face three opposition leaders in three years going into your 16th, you know, your, your 13, 14th to 16th years of, of, of government was an enormous ask. Um, most of all, I hope that this book is a study in political leadership at what was a pivotal time in the nation's history, but a study to be read and seen in the context of a wider mosaic, um, together, put together, 
by many smart and thoughtful people bringing a lot of different perspectives to bear. And although the timing is somewhat accidental, I do think it's all the more compelling against the contemporary political landscape. I can't think of a greater vacuum of national leadership in Australia since Federation than the one we've experienced in the recent past. We didn't need opinion polls to confirm what I believe was a huge collective sigh of relief around the nation when the Abbott boil was lanced. And now, if the other side of politics can just deal with its own embarrassing leadership vacuum, maybe we can look forward to something approximating genuine, intelligent debate about the big, important issues of our time and get this country back on the road. I just think it's been appalling. Today, I'd like to draw on four examples of Keating-style leadership to give a flavour of what's in the book, the risk taker with a touch of madness, the self-styled skier going down the double black run with one ski, the guy for whom the gap between confidence and arrogance was paper thin, but a leader with the imagination and intelligence to have the vision and grasp the big ideas and the courage to back himself in. The first example is foreign policy. Just nine days after taking power from Bob Hawke in December 91, Paul Keating answered the doorbell at Kirribilli House to the American president. George Bush Senior had come to see his mate Bob, but got Keating instead. So what does Keating do? He could have played it safe as the foreign affairs new boy dealing with such a high stakes visit, done the glad handing, played the straight diplomatic game, mumbled a few obligatory things about ANZUS, and got on with the job of trying to close the massive popularity gap with Houston and the Liberals. No. Ashton Kelvert, Keating's new foreign policy advisor who was there, commented later that Keating dominated the meeting in a way that was both shameless and compelling. Keating started by taking Bush through the strategic history of post-war Europe to the end of the Cold War. And quote, the important opportunity that presented to the United States in the Pacific Asia. Now we know the Americans love being lectured. Keating then proceeded to outline his idea to establish the first big formal leaders forum in the Asia Pacific. As he put it, stitch together a very pretty piece of foreign policy with Australia as a middle power with a foot in the American camp and a foot in Asia. A somewhat bemused George Bush says, if you can just imagine the picture, well, that's very interesting, Paul. We must think about it. I know. Why don't we leave it to you to get the ball rolling? See you later. So I suspect that George Bush, as he left Australia, didn't really anticipate that he'd be hearing much more about Keating's idea for a new APEC Leaders Forum. So what does Keating do? He writes to every leader in the region. He makes his first visit uh, abroad to Indonesia, making again a big statement that he sees Indonesia as Australia's most important future relationship and, uh, and is, doing, is um, uh, a very deliberate in his pursuit of a workable, close relationship with Suharto. And I questioned him about Suharto because we all know the, the, the Suharto, uh, the, the, the background of massive corruption and we know the East Timor connection and human rights and all the rest of it. And um, it's, it's interesting what he has to say about what he told Suharto on East Timor and there's no point in a Prime Minister bullshitting about what he or she says in those events because the record does eventually come out. Uh, and, uh, and there are witnesses. And I, I get the feeling that uh, I'm inclined to believe him more than not when he says how closely he pushed Suharto on East Timor, and he's pushed him pretty close, and Suharto gets up to go to the toilet. And in fact, there, there's some interesting toilet break moments uh, through Keating's uh, various diplomatic and, and states, uh, head of state meetings. One is with Clinton in the urinal, where the, together they, uh, they decide that, uh, so that uh, Mahathir is a bastard. I think Bush goes to the urinal at one point so Scowcroft can have a little tater-tate -tate with Keating and explain to him how the games really work. Uh, so Suharto goes to the toilet and his, his interpreter says, Mr Keating, I think Mr Suharto is indicating to you that this is as much as he wants to talk about East Timor. So that was the end of that at that meeting. 
But he says to Suharto, this is the idea I've got for APEC. It is madness that there is not a big strategic leaders meeting for our region, and you would be a very big part of it. Oh, says Suharto. Um, can you get Japan? Uh, Keating says, well, if I get Miyazawa from Japan, will you be in it? Suharto says, if you can get Miyazawa, I'll be in it. So Keating hot foots it across to Tokyo and says to Miyazawa, I can get Suharto if you'll be in it. Miyazawa says, oh, well, if you can get Suharto, I'm there. He then goes to China. Uh, Li Peng's a little uh, harder because, of course, in the APEC ministerial meeting, you've got... Um, uh, you've got uh, Taiwan, which China doesn't recognise, and Hong Kong, which at that stage was still a British Connolly that China didn't recognise. So there was this slight technical hitch. Uh, so Keating saying to Li Peng, uh, of course you'll be in it, and Li Peng saying, no, I'm not going to be in it, and Keating saying, but what? What? Uh, the US President's going to be in it, the Prime Minister of Japan's going to be in it, and you're not going to be in it? Of course you're going to be in it. And Li Peng's wife pipes up and says, Please don't speak to my husband like that. He's recovering from a heart attack. <laughs> so uh, Keating pulls back and they regroup the next day and they find another formula for, for making APEC acceptable to the Chinese, which was really just a play of words. But the thing, then he, uh, you know, so he's got China sort of there. He's got um, Japan and, and uh, Indonesia in the game. He goes back to America and Bush is getting a bit more interested and realises he's got to take this strange guy from down under a bit more seriously. Then Bush is gone anyway and he's got to start all over again with Clinton. And he gets Clinton in the bag. Clinton works out because Clinton has said, uh, you know, in the election he's just won, it's the economy, stupid, uh, to Americans. Uh, so he says to, to Keating, my problem is that... Um, I can't now go off on what will very quickly be described as, as a, a foreign adventure when I've been saying I'm here to get the economy going. I know what we'll do. I mean, they work out that they'll make it, that they'll make it an economic forum of leaders. So Clinton, that, and the first one's in Seattle, home of Boeing and Microsoft, we'll make it about jobs, says Clinton. This is how these guys deal. But you don't often hear it told in this way. So Clinton's on board. Clinton becomes a mate of Keating's. So the first, the first apex out of the road, the second one is in Bogor, and uh, Clinton comes and he's haggard and he's red-eyed, uh, and he tells Keating, which is possibly gilding the lily a bit, but he tells Cle Keating that although he's, of course he's taking it seriously and he's there for the forum, but the real reason he's there, as he tells him over lunch, is I want to know how you've managed to stay in office against the Conservatives in Australia, because of course he, uh, he had been slathered in the midterm election and uh, Newt Gingrich uh, was about to bang him over the head even further uh, with a very tough uh, new ball game. So, so Clinton's there as, uh, as Keating is saying, oh, you've got to take them by the throat, Bill, and rattle the life out of them. And he said, and he said, he said I was talking dirty to him. I said, what did you mean talking dirty? <laughs> he said, well, he said, when... Uh, when Howard became leader, I said to my office, he said, I'm going to drive an axe through his chest and rip his ribs apart. It's talking dirty. And so Clinton was exposed to, to the, 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 what, what it really was, was Keating explaining how by forcing the Liberals further to the right and occupying the centre, Labor kept them out of office. And that's exactly what Clinton did. I mean, he, was, he had the, the germ of it anyway, but that's exactly what Clinton did in America. So... And, and, and at the same time at Bogord, only the second uh, uh, APEC meeting, I'll, I'll close this down to get onto the others, but um, because Australia's uh, had, had driven the idea, they, they, they ran the secretariat for APEC. So in the Bogor meeting with all of these people around the table, and you start in, you start in Seattle with the president uh, uh, of, uh, with the leader of uh, America and the leader of China, not being prepared to actually look at each other as they shake hands for the formal photograph, and Keating's had to introduce them. Uh, he said, "By he said by Bogor, I had I had uh, I had the Chinese up doing karaoke," um, and you can believe him because he's that kind of character. But because they've got the secretariat, they do the draft memorandum for what became quite an important declaration for free trade in the region. Uh, 
Suharto was the host, but Australia's writing the drafts, running the Secretariat, and so Keating, the, the description Keating gave of what he did in that room, he was sort of moving around the room from delegation to delegation, and as things got more complicated and some of the leaders had, had sort of moved past the, the briefs that their, that their advisers had given them, he was basically suggesting how they should refashion amendments for their next thing. I said to him, it sounds like a, like a National Labor Conference, and he beamed and he said, yes. That's what it was like, and that's what they did. I mean, the Australians basically ran this event, and then the third, the third uh, APEC meeting in Osaka, the Australians and the Japanese combined to see that um, uh, that declaration accepted formally, and it was at the same. It was at Osaka where Clinton didn't make it, because by this stage Gingrich was pummeling him so badly he just couldn't afford to leave America. But Keating got very cross with that, and so did the Prime Minister of Japan and, uh, and uh, Al Gore, because there's, a, there's another book of Clinton's where it's revealed that Al Gore went back. To, he, told, he told Keating at Osaka, he said, you make me feel like a skunk at the party. And he went back to, uh, to Clinton and said that basically they'd been baked by the Australians uh, and the Japanese uh, over Clinton's failure to turn up. So... It's leadership, very much in Keating's style, but in the context of APEC, very effective. And, and every move potentially a risk, because the early part of this took place in 1992, when Keating could not afford to make a mistake. He was so far, and Labor was so far behind the eight ball um, in, in going into the 93 election uh, that all the focus really was supposed to be about the economy and being seen to get Australia working again after the Keating recession. But he's doing all of this stuff and other things that weren't going to deliver him votes necessarily, but he was doing them because he had the conviction about the need for Australia to be doing these things. He wanted to forge a new path for Australia. And you might say, oh, well, yeah, that's interesting, and then, then there's the Republic, and that's interesting, and then there was uh, Mabo, and that's interesting. But he always had a picture where he wove these things together into a, into a plan and a vision. Um, Mabo uh, is a standout to me because 92, June 92, the High Court drops uh, Mabo in the lap of the government because they throw Terra Nullius out as, uh, as a viable proposition. Uh, and the whole ball game with regard to uh, average to uh, native title and uh, ownership of land was up for grabs. And as Keating says, he could have uh, sat on his hands and allowed the courts to sort out the mess, which would probably have taken years and God knows what outcome it would have, it would have yielded. But he decided in this same election year where they're so far behind the ball that he needs every post to be a winner, he takes on Mabo. December 92, the election's three months away, he delivers the Redfin speech. And uh, uh, it's worth just reminding you about, about the, the words of Redfin and why he did it. It was about, about uh, recognising that we, as he put it, uh, we took the land, we did the murders, we supplied the grog, and he went on. And I imagine every person in the room is familiar with the content. And what he says as to why he was prepared to take that punt, he said, I always believed that you should burn the capital as you run to the poll rather than conserving it, being Mr Safe Guy. A seminal issue like this and its remedy provide the uplift that any p political personality needs doing what is right and good. It gives you the surge. And without the surge, what are you? You're just mucking around with tricky press statements and fleeting appearances at doorstops. So he then, having won the election, and there was not a single vote in it for Keating when he did the Redfern speech, it probably cost him votes. But he did go on and he did win the 93 election and he then sat down personally and put the full weight of the Prime Minister's office behind getting a workable native title legislation package into the Parliament. And the very first meeting 
was with Indigenous leaders, none of whom technically uh, had the authority to be representing uh, Aboriginal Australia because various Aboriginal communities have their own leadership and there was no kind of, I mean there was ATSIC, uh, but ATSIC didn't have the authority to, uh, to negotiate on this and it took Lower Chair O'Donoghue to insert some leadership of her own to get, the, get a group of these people together. Keating says, we are going to meet at the heart of executive government. We are going to meet under the, under the flag of the nation at the centre of Parliament House in the Cabinet Room and you've got to take it seriously, he said to the Indigenous leaders. The challenge to you is, if you want to be taken seriously here, this is not an occasion where you drop a list of proposals on the table and when we say we can't immediately meet all of these, you walk out calling us racists. Not going to work like that. You've got to make up your minds. And Noel Pearson said much later that those comments really stung him and that Keating was right. And, and, and the way that group came together, because they were just as suspicious and almost as hostile as some of the other stakeholders in the Mabo debate, the state premiers, the farmers, uh, the miners, uh, and so on. And there was an awful lot of, uh, awful lot of inflammatory stuff went on around that period. Keating, you know, you've got John Dawkins preparing uh, his post-election budget, which Keating and others, uh, Keating says that he believes that that was the point really where he lost the 96 election, the 93 budget. Well, he can't put all the blame on John Dawkins because Dawkins would say that there were a number of times he tried to get in to see Keating at crucial moments and he couldn't because Keating was dealing with Mabo. So you've got two sides of the leadership equation there. The one I'm focusing on is the drive-through of what I hope everyone in this room would regard as an incredibly important moment in Australian history in terms of, in terms of the nation's relationship with its Aboriginal population. Uh, and, and even right at the death, coming up to Christmas, uh, Labor's leaders in the Senate, led by Gareth Evans, are saying, Cobber, we've fought the fight, we can't do it. We cannot get this through the Parliament. So Keating rolls up his sleeves, he threatens the Greens, he tells them he will come and personally, there were two Greens from Western Australia, he will personally campaign to see them out of the Senate at the next election. He will make it his number one job. So threatening Keating, but it worked, he got the votes. And what outraged him about that was that you had two white Greens, pardon the pun, two white Greens sitting in that Senate refusing to sign off on a deal that had been agreed to by Aboriginal leaders after months and months and months of negotiation. We know better, we know better. So the Mabo legislation went through. Um, I'll, I'll do one more, and uh, rather than four, I'll do one more example and then come to my point. Uh, this is the, uh, the push for the Republic. So these were three elements, I think, the foreign policy, uh, native title, and uh, the Republic were three elements that Keating wanted to be seen as the landmark elements of his prime ministership. He talked about, you know, when it comes to giving out uh, continents, not many people get one, we got one. You know, we got our own continent as a nation. What do you do with it? Who are we? What are we? Um, he talked about repointing the raft to Asia. He talked about um, running a debate that was going to confront Australians to actually really think seriously about who and what we are. And, uh, and he did that partly through Mabo, and he did it partly uh, through the Republic debate, and, and, and broadly with the Republic national identity. There was the issue of the flag, another Keatingism. What self-respecting country would have the flag of another nation in the corner of your own flag? Uh, do you know at one point, um, some of you might remember, he tried to persuade Cheryl Kerno to back him in the Senate to, uh, to get a bill through Parliament, it must have been a bill, to fly two flags over the, over the National Parliament, the Australian flag and the Eureka. And uh, Cheryl couldn't quite do it. But so he was, he was, look, you know, you might think partly mischief, but, but also quite serious. So he, he really went nowhere with the flag debate at the time. He was fighting on so many fronts. Uh, and I said to him, and this is another quote worth going back to, I said to him, 
Um, Neville, you, you've got out in front on the issue of the flag, and in the end it went nowhere. And, uh, and he said, but you've got to fight the fight. And I said, well, Neville ran said once when he was Premier of New South Wales that you could never afford as leader to get too far in front of the mob. And that absolutely incensed Pe uh, Keating. He said, I despise those remarks. They stand for everything I stand against. Um, wouldn't you take... He said, here we are, this massive country, this continent, with just 23 million of us, now aligned to the fastest growing part of the world. Wouldn't you take every opportunity to capitalise it? Why would you dumb down your own people? The biggest issue facing Australia today... He means now, today, still, is a psychological one. Do we want to be in it, the Asian construct? Do we really want to be in it? Yet we have to be in it both for our prosperity and our security, so somewhere a leader has to tackle the shibboleths. The shibboleths have to be taken on, and the notion that we should just go along with the mob rather than actually lead them is classic New South Wales hustler politics. I said, but that's the school that bred you. He said, they bred me, that's true, but they never had any part of me in the intellectual sense. <laughs> so he goes on with the, with the uh, you know, he stirs the Liberals um, uh, when the Queen comes and he says to the Queen uh, in the formal lunchtime speech, um, in future we're going to be uh, seeking a more independent path in our own region. Uh, the Liberals were absolutely outraged. This was terribly insulting to the Queen, but that was where he really launched his national identity stroke republic debate. And, uh, and by the time he had appointed Malcolm Turnbull, very deliberately, Turnbull was not, he, he may or may not have been a member of the Liberal Party, but he wasn't a, he, he wasn't a, a, a full on identity of the party. But nonetheless, um, he, he quite deliberately chose Turnbull and, and Nick Greiner was also on his advisory committee to come up with a minimalist model that could be acceptable to the conservative side of politics for a republic because he knew, as we know now, that there will never be a republic uh, unless you can have a model that is acceptable to both sides of politics. And so when, they, when the Turnbull Advisory Committee came up with the model that they did and he rings Howard to tell him and Howard says, um, have you got a president elected by the parliament? And he said, yes. And Howard says, good. So Keating thinks, all right, we've got the model we need. And he was going to go to the 96 election, saying that there'd be, there would then be a plebis, there'd be a referendum in the next election, uh, in, in the next term, early in the next term, for Australians to vote on a republic. Now, he didn't get it. And I don't think that was a failure on his part, because in uh, 95, there was a point in 95 where in Sydney and Melbourne, something like 70% of Australians in opinion polls supported a republic. So he, he won the debate. But... This goes back to what I said earlier about while he's caught up fighting the Republic fight, while he's fighting Mabo and putting the act together, while he's stitching up his pretty piece of foreign policy and he's dispensing with Houston and he's dispensing with Downer, of course, along comes John Howard and he became a different proposition. So um, I, um, I hold those three cases up as examples of a kind of leadership which to me is compelling. He had his failures. He had his failures and he made his mistakes. But he has some really outstanding examples, I think, of good and effective leadership. Um, and I want to juxtapose those examples of leadership against what I regard as the great failure of modern leadership on a policy issue in Australia that is deeply troubling and has already been burnt into this nation's history and tarnished its spirit, and that's the issue of asylum seekers. You look at the excruciating and shameful mess this policy has become after more than 20 years in the making, and you have to ask if you have any ethical or moral conscience at all. Is this the best we can do? Is this really what we stand for as Australians? Is this really a true reflection of who and what we are as a nation. Without minimising the problem or ignoring a nation's rights broadly to decide and manage its immigration intake, we do have formal responsibilities under the United Nations Charter, responsibilities that we signed up to. And having reported on this issue 
and watched the ups and downs, mostly downs, for more than 20 years, the great shame to me is that proper debate on this issue was seriously distorted in 2001, first through the tamper incident and then the inflammatory and now discredited claims around the so-called kids overboard affair, from which the Labor opposition also emerged as a much diminished party. And any attempt since then to find a way back to fundamental decency while still retaining control of our borders has ended up bogged down in emotive and at times despicable politics. Malcolm Turnbull is working his way through some very interesting decisions, displaying a standard of calm, considered leadership we all probably feel we've been starved of for a long time. Such is the way of politics and the times we live in that his job is only going to get tougher and the tests of his leadership are only going to get harder. But is there a more fundamental test of leadership than this when it really comes down to it? I know we always want to have an economy that's healthy. We want our jobs, we want our security, we want to survive as a nation. But don't we also want our self-respect? So is there a more fundamental test of leadership than this? Calm the debate. Take the cheap, cheap exploitation of fear and emotion out of the political equation. Co-opt the opposition in a genuine bipartisan search for a moral and ethically acceptable outcome as well as a practical one. One that also enlists the obvious other countries in our region who are players in the process. Leadership that draws a line in the sand and does not rest until there is a resolution that allows us individually and collectively to look in the mirror and not be ashamed of what we see. I understand the irony in looking to Keating style leadership to resolve this issue, uh, given uh, that it was his government that first established detention centres, and we do talk about that in the book. The thing about Paul Keating was this, that once he was convinced by an issue, the need to adopt a policy or find a policy solution that needed to be found that was important and that was right, he put his stamp of authority on it and he didn't stop trying until he'd found a way through. So that, I think, uh, is a gauntlet that Malcolm Turnbull should be prepared to take up. And I'd be surprised, actually, if in the, at least the back of his mind it's not there. He'll choose his timing, but, but the longer he is in office, the harder it's going to be. On the 110th anniversary of John Howard's, oh, sorry, on the 10th anniversary, <laughs> sometimes it felt like 100. On the 10th anniversary of John Howard's prime ministership, prime ministership, a journalist asked Keating how he felt about the fact that his arch political enemy had already lasted as prime minister more than twice as long as him and was still going. And Keating replied, well, I always felt that I'd rather be John the 23rd than Pius the 12th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. And if you want to read more, of course, there are books available at the, at the back there. And if you're very nice to him, Kerry will personally autograph them before he leaves uh, today. So we have a couple of roving microphones around the room there. We'll start, uh, yeah, there at the back for some questions. Kerry, yeah. the Prime Minister John Hyde said that the press gallery was far more impressed with Keating's performance than the general public. Um, I haven't read your book. But I did see your interviews, and I must say that having been through that here in the press gallery, I thought you were awfully sore on Keating, and I wondered whether doing so many interviews and getting so close to him, you actually lose all perspective, all your sceptical touch. Because I have to say, on some of those situations where he mentioned, he said, for example, when you asked him about the tariff cuts, he said, ah, oh, you know, those people, they were only out for a day, they got a job the day, the day after. The research shows that the textile clothing and footwear workers, five years after the tariff cuts, and it's absolutely horrible, 50% of them were still unemployed. Auto workers, one third, were still unemployed three years after, according to the latest research. <coughs> you let him get away with this sort of nonsense, and I must say, having listened to you just now, you let him get, get away with, with so much. Um, you know, this first, you, you say journalists should have Is there a question, question there? We'll just get the... Just very briefly, yeah. you say, you know, this, this asylum seeker issue should be tackled calmly. When did Keating ever tackle something calmly? So I come to uh, my question. Did you and the Canberra Press Gallery, and I know I was there, but I was the odd man out, uh, not become overawed by Keating, 
and becomes cheer squad and not proper journalists? I'm not, I'm not sure there's an answer I'm going to give that's going to even go close to um, um, changing your mind, because I suspect uh, your mind is beyond changing. Uh, you and I must have been in different galleries, mate, because there were many times where I saw Keating taken to task in press conferences. Uh, I did interviews with Keating that I would suggest to you, if you went and looked at the transcripts, uh, showed no awe, whatever. And there was one, for instance, uh, at the end of 92, in November of 92, where I devoted half an hour of late line to an interview with Paul Keating, uh, from which he emerged angry, uh, where the gallery said it was a game changer where I clinically went through all of the key um, uh, benchmarks that he had set for himself with One Nation and showed where each of those benchmarks had not been met. And there were some questions he simply couldn't answer. Uh, Graham Richardson said in an interview to somebody at The Age uh, some years later that he'd never seen Keating eviscerated quite like that before. So uh, you're, giving, you're doing something that you're accusing me of doing, I must suggest to you. Secondly, if you read the book, you would find many, many, many questions that challenge Keating, and on the particular question of tariffs, bearing in mind that in covering a prime ministership, uh, not just a prime ministership, essentially covering uh, a political life in a single book, uh, there are things that get jettisoned. There are... No, oh, sorry, I'll go back to the series. There's more a point for the series because there are elaborations uh, precisely on the issue of, of the tariffs and jobs and and his claims about that in the book, more so than in the series. I did 16 hours of interview uh, for the series, which we had to cut down to four. A lot of things ended up on the, on the floor in the process. But when he, ma when he made the claim about they had a job a week later, I did challenge that. I did precisely challenge that. I said, where? And he, uh, he acknowledged that they, they weren't all necessarily uh, a week later that, uh, in f and, and in fact, they were in different industries and some of them were part-time jobs. And some, he says, some he acknowledges, certainly in the book, he acknowledges did not get work. But then says, but then uh, I drove the reforms called Working Nation to tackle long-term unemployment in Australia, uh, which were designed specifically for people who had been victims uh, of the tariff cuts of the recession and so on. So. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't, the, the, the exercise was not like an extended 7.30 report where every second question is um, combative. It was an attempt to draw this man out into a discussion to look at how, to look at the things that drove him, uh, to look at, uh, at the things that made him the person he was, to look at how he used uh, his his leadership, and if you read the media section in the book, I don't think you'll say I've let him off the hook there. I think it's quite revealing about the way he went about changing media laws. I mean, I'm not, I won't go on, and I, I hope I'm not sounding defensive about this. It's not perfect. The, uh, television never is, I might tell you. But the gallery was not the way you described it. Some were, some were in awe. Some talked about how they didn't particularly like him, but if they got too close to him, they fell for the spell. Yeah, there was a bit of that. But it wasn't a universal thing and it wasn't happening all the time. Do you think Laurie Oakes was in his thrall? How many other exceptions do you think there are? Ellen Ramsey? Ellen Ramsey? Anyway. And off we go. Uh, over here. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, ladies, fir ladies first, Barry. Um, Australia's not very good at using its previous leaders. How do you think? we would be best used in order to get the best out of Paul Keating in the future? I think, uh, I think you'd be surprised at how much, at how much he has consulted. Um, I'm not sure that John Howard rang him up all that often, um, and I'm not sure he would have rung John Howard up very often if the shoe was on the other foot. But um, uh, certainly the Labor Prime Ministers rang him, uh, and I, I think there has been at least one conversation with Malcolm Turnbull. I mean, this guy, um, when, we did the, when we did the Opera House conversation and, uh, and we were coming down here to do it, I said, so what are you going to do, what are you doing next? He said, oh, he said, I'm going to China. I said, what are you going to do in China? He said, I've got a one-on-one -on -one with Xi Jinping. This is a guy who's been out of office for 20 years. I mean, he is regarded seriously in, in the corridors of power 
in various important parts of the world, and I'd be very surprised if, uh, if that wasn't being picked up on. I mean, his, his uh, Barangaroo in Sydney became a preoccupation of his, so it's a kind of semi-public contribution. Uh, but a lot of people are on the phone to him. I saw some very interesting people coming and going as I was walking to and from the office. Yeah, Barry. Jerry, Barry Donovan here. Good to see you at the Melbourne Press Club. Um, first of all, congratulations on the, uh, the TV series interviews that you, uh, you did with Keating. That was terrific. Uh, well, one of the good things about it was that when sometimes when Paul was in full flight, you stopped him and said, I don't know, I was there and it didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. And Keating, to his credit, stopped and gathered and said, yes, you're, you're right. And so it made the difference the fact that you had the background to be able to do that with him. Just one other reference to one other situation, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. Do you think there will ever be a mutual acknowledgement or reconciliation before one of them will depart? I doubt it. I doubt it. Uh, I, I, think that, um, I think they are moving towards that uh, and had had various um, exchanges and found themselves in the same place more than once. Um, but then there was Blanche's book. And in fact, uh, as Keating tells it, and uh, I actually quite coincidentally knew somebody else who was at this, at the, this particular dinner. Blanche invited uh, Keating to dinner at their home. And Keating's wondering why he's been invited, but he, um, he thinks, oh, well, you know, I'll go along. This might uh, be, be good to sort of break things down a bit. So he goes along and he has the dinner, but he walks away wondering why he'd been invited. And a few days later, Blanche, this is Keating's version, Blanche calls him and says, uh, Paul, I'm updating my biography on Bob and I wonder if you'd cooperate. And <laughs> Paul said, I don't think so, Blanche. And uh, clearly didn't like what happened because that was when the gloves came off again. And they've never come back on and I don't think they will. I mean, I've said in the introduction that you can see the pain when he talks about it sometimes, um, that, uh, that, that he... he wants us all to know that and to, to recognise that this was one of the great political partnerships in terms of its effectiveness and that they were also close friends, genuine mates. Um, but by the time that conversation has ended, he's gone off again, you know, on another um, angry outburst about because he's remembered a moment with Hawke, and uh, in reading some of the margin, some of the notes in the margin of those 10,000 newspaper articles that he'd collected, I don't know too many other Prime Ministers who've collected 10,000 newspaper articles on the way through, um, but uh, the notes in the margin, there was one, there was one uh, during the tax reform cabinet debate where he's come back to his office and he's written alongside a, uh, an article which has got a comment derogatory to him attributed to Hawke, which Keating assumes someone on Hawke's side has leaked, and he's written in the margin, envious little bastard. And there were a few more in that vein. But that was a kind of... Uh, I, I, I'm inclined to believe that it's far more right than wrong, and Barry would be a good person to ask this, um, that, um, that even though they did have their spikes of antipathy, that by and large that relationship worked exceptionally well uh, until 1988, when they had the big explosion over the bringing home the bacon budget, where um, uh, Bob Hawke says that uh, Keating's replaceable. And uh, so they had another great outburst, they had the Kirribilli Agreement, and then it settled down again. But, uh, but you know, it's over. Yes, over there. Yeah, hi, Kerry. Um, I'm just wondering um, if you think or if you believe that Turnbull has... Uh, a plan for reform, and if so, is it achievable with his current cabinet? I, um, I, uh, Turnbull is one of those restless minds that you'd, you'd be very surprised uh, if in the last, and, and given that, that, you know, you're not Robinson Crusoe and working out that, uh, that Malcolm has had the ambition for this job for a very long time. Now, Unlike his predecessor, I think most people who have an ambition like that for a very long time uh, tend to think about what they do if they get the job. And, and so um, I, I think that one thing that has surprised me has been the speed with which he has moved 
the Liberal Party back to the centre of the political debate. And the question then is, if he's able to sustain that within his own ranks, the question then is, where does that leave Labor? Uh, d does Labor continue to try to occupy the centre? And it was interesting in that regard that um, on climate change, uh, we read this morning that, um, uh, that uh, Shorten is going to try uh, to take Labor back to a, a differentiation, a, a sort of um, back somewhat closer to where they started all those years ago uh, in, um, in contrast to the Liberals' policy on climate change. But broadly speaking, I think that Turnbull represents an enormous problem to Labor, even if they do find a real leader. Uh, because uh, if, he, if he's able to maintain the kind of decorum that he is at this point and uses his brain, um, uh, he could be in office for a long time. Uh, Kerry, uh, Tony Thomas, ex Fairfax. Um, how many unauthorised asylum seekers would you like Australia to take per annum? Could you please put a number on it? No. I'm not a policy maker. I'm not a policy maker and I'm not, I've thought about this a lot, uh, but uh, I, I think the solution, the solution has to be one that involves Indonesia and Malaysia, but in a genuine tripartite uh, effort. And that's only going to happen, you see, the, the reason I, I, I looked at, at the way Keating dealt with his Asian neighbours as effectively as he did. Um, uh, and saw the outcomes that he achieved, I wondered to myself, if you had a Keating with the brain and the resolve and the touch and the determination to get an outcome that is both humane but at the same time effective in maintaining some kind of control. So uh, I recognise that you can't have a situation... Um, you can't have a situation where it looks incredibly attractive to the poor bastards on the other side of the world who are living in misery and fear uh, that, they, that they break away from the, from the hopeless system that, that operates where they can try and find their way to an appalling detention camp uh, where, and if they've got children, possibly watch their children die there. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of Jekyll and Hyde thing and it's, and, and it's tough. It's absolutely tough. It's not, I absolutely recognise that, that for somebody supporting the refugee and the, the asylum seeker cause says, look, you know, all the ref you could get all the refugees who come here and they'd only fit into one, two, three, four or five football fields. That is utterly and grossly simplistic and doesn't help the debate at all. And, the, and it is complex. And, uh, and there are people who are trying to uh, to come to country, to resettle in countries like Australia uh, for all the uh, appropriate and relevant reasons and who are trusting uh, a, a dysfunctional United Nations system. Uh, and and if, if, a, if, if you are going to be uh, punishing people who might have a good chance of coming in under humanitarian intake uh, by accepting people who arrive by unorthodox means, OK, tough issue, not my job. My job as a journalist, primarily, is to put the light on the problems and look at the people who are charged with the responsibility of coming up with the answers. Now, if a brilliant answer occurred to me, I'd have it. I'd, I'd tell you. But what I'm, what I'm interested in is the fact that I think, I think that the image we are putting out to the world on this issue and the image we're being asked to live with ourselves is an appalling one. And there's got to be a better way. Got time for one more question? Oh, if, uh, just uh, down the front here, yep. While the mic's coming, uh, Kerry, hypothetically speaking, if we crunch together political generations, how would uh, Paul Keating, Labor leader, match up against Malcolm Turnbull, Liberal leader? And well, who'd, who'd win? It'd be interesting. I mean, look, it's like saying, <coughs> you know, Farlap and... Um, Farlap and... Um, like Gilead. No, no, that... <laughs> <laughs> no, Farlap far and Maccabi Diva. You know, it's, it's, I think different styles, different times, but most particularly different times. The fact is, if Keating had risen up through this era, he would have gone to university. That's an interesting question in itself. What difference would that have made to him? Would he have been a more disciplined thinker? Uh, would he have uh, been a more cautious person? 
Uh, would the imagination have been stifled or would it have been expanded? Uh, and, uh, and what party would have been around him? Uh, so, uh, I mean, the circumstances in which Malcolm Turnbull is functioning are the circumstances partly created by Paul Keating, Bob Hawke, and, and that period of Labor government, as well as by the media. I, look, I think, um, I think uh, it j would just be fascinating. Last question. Kevin, you're informed in the age. Um, just a quick question, this is, you, given Malcolm Turnbull is a Republican, meeting is, sorry, <coughs> um, would you like to see Paul Keating as Australia's first president if we ever become a republic, and one hopes we will, and would he like to be um, Australia's first president? I imagine a part of him would find it irresistible and another part of him would think, well, if it's the kind of president I want Australia to have, I don't want to be it. Uh, because that, that president would be relatively quiet, going to garden parties and staying out of the way of the business of government. Um, I think that it would be a fascinating proposition, uh, but I think that anybody thinking seriously about it would, uh, would look to the personality of Paul Keating and wonder, and wonder whether he could actually control himself in the job. I, I don't think he'd, I, I think when the chips were down he wouldn't take it even if it was offered. That's my suspicion. Well, Kerry, uh, thank you. It was a great speech and a fantastic uh, history lesson. It was a very generous 20 minutes, by the way, so thank you very, <laughs> very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Kerry O'Brien.